Well, now we get started with week seven of the course, the final week of this part one of the history of rock. Uh, we'll be talking about the psychedelic era, which is generally thought of as the time from about 1966 through 1969, uh, the very end of the 60s. Uh, I call this uh, chapter in the book, I think, High Times and Big Ideas. And if I say that somewhere, I'm not really quite sure where. Uh, but let's review where, how, how we got to this point. Um, we talked about the British invasion, the Beatles coming to this country in uh, 1964, February 1964, and starting a craze for British music. Uh, we talked about an American response, the Birds and Bob Dylan, the summer in 1965 and their response to the um, to the uh, uh, the music of the Beatles and the British invasion and bringing the the rise of folk rock and, and a lot of the music that came with that um, and then we talked about at the same time the rise of Motown and Stax during the mid 60s and this um, the, the black pop scene uh, during those years and so all of that is kind of blending together as we get into 1966 and uh, we have a psychedelic scene that begins to arise and so we're going to talk about that um, uh, this week uh, and I, I want to just before we start I want to talk about some of the main ideas that are going to come up during this week's uh, lectures one of the most important ones that we're going to talk about is the idea of mainstream versus subculture. Um, when we talk about subcultures, music, uh, musical scholars like to talk about this topic an awful lot because a subculture means something that's going on in a musical scene that's sort of off the mainstream radar. So in, in this case, for example, we're going to talk about a psychedelic subculture that's happening in San Francisco and a parallel one that's happening in London. And for the first year and a half, maybe two years of that scene, it's pretty much off the radar. The only way you would know about the psychedelic uh, subculture is if you actually went there and visited. Every now and again, something in the news, but not really, uh, not really sort of mainstream. So you've got mainstream acts doing one kind of thing sort of in the public eye, nationally, internationally. And you've got other acts that are, that are developing something uh, as well, mm, what we're going to call the psychedelic uh, movement, the psychedelic psychedelic music is happening in a kind of subcultural uh, thing. And so we're going to make a distinction between mainstream acts and subculture acts and talk a, a bit about the subcultures in San Francisco and London and to a certain extent Los Angeles. The second big idea um, is what we're going to call the growth of musical ambition and the formation of something I call the hippie aesthetic. Uh, this is the idea that as we, as we go from the end of the 50s through the 1960s, we can begin to trace a pattern of musicians, at least some musicians, getting increasingly ambitious about what the music should do. The music starts to become much more important as a kind of artistic utterance, artistic creation, as opposed to just being a kind of, uh, a kind of thing that's, uh, where the music is made and then easily disposed of, like a paper towel or a Dixie cup or something like that. Use it once and throw it away. Instead, they start having much more ambitious uh, uh, ideas about what their music can be, that it can start really sort of start to become art. We talked a bit about that with regard to the Beatles and the Beach Boys and Dylan uh, in previous weeks. So here's where all of that is really going to come uh, together for us. We also want to ask the question, how can music be psychedelic? I can, I can understand how drugs can be psychedelic, but how can music be psychedelic? And the, one of the distinctions we're going to make here is the idea of music accompanying the drug trip as opposed to music being a kind of trip of its own. So we will follow those themes uh, all the way through this week. So let's dive right in now. And let's talk about the rise of LSD. We talk about psychedelia. We really can't talk about psychedelic music without saying something about drug use. And I don't want it to be understood that somehow I am endorsing drug use or telling people who watch these videos that they should go out and try this because it's fantastic. None of that is what's going on here. As a historian, we're just looking at this objectively, trying to figure out exactly what went Went on. Uh, LSD, uh, well, there, well, the, while there were a lot of drugs sort of circulating around during this period, LSD is the one that's usually focused on uh, because it's a hallucinogenic drug that, that has uh, some of the effects, at least according to its proponents, has some of the effects that, that comport with some of the counterculture philosophy ideals and the aesthetic that goes with it. LSD itself was developed by a Swiss chemist by the name of Albert Hoffman in 1943. He was looking for a cure for migraine headaches um, and so had been handling this particular formulation of the drug uh, in, the, um, in the lab and a as the story goes uh, did not really ingest it but the, the, the drug um, 
was absorbed through the skin, through touching, uh, touching a formulation of it. And so it was absorbed into his bloodstream, bloodstream through the skin. So he, he maybe wasn't so aware that that had occurred. After all, even if he was aware of it, what's the worst that could happen? He would be protected maybe against migraine headache because that's what he was shooting for. But scientists work on a lot of drugs and not, most of them don't pan out. And so he probably had no real fears about that. Well, the story that's often told, who knows whether it's true. A lot of times these things are apocryphal, but and exaggerated. But his lab assistant saw that he was acting a little bit funny as he was getting ready to leave the lab that day. And uh, apparently, uh, he, both he and the lab assistant rode to work on bicycles. Uh, and so uh, 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 Hoffman uh, gets onto his bike and is going to be driving home. And the lab assistant thinks, well, just for safety's sake, I think I better uh, follow him. Uh, apparently, as, the, um, as he was taking this bicycle trip home, the LSD started to kick in, and according to Albert Hoffman's perception of what was going on, he was going very, very slowly, and the horizon was rising and falling, and he was having all these experiences with color, and it was like it was, the whole thing was happening in slow motion. According to the lab assistant, he was going like crazy on this bike, and what we had there essentially in 1943 in Switzerland was the first real LSD trip. Well, after Hoffman saw what it could do, he sort of wrote up his, um, his findings and uh, the drug was, uh, 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 people were looking for what can we do with the drug that has these kinds of effects. Uh, the CIA, the American uh, Intelligence Organization, uh, got involved and thought, well, maybe this would be a great truth serum to use like on Russian spies or whatever to get them to spill the secrets that were we, we would like to hear about. And it was uh, also uh, thought of for a while by psychiatrists as a possible uh, uh, treatment, in lower doses of course, a possible treatment for alcoholism. Uh, and so the people who knew about this drug were people in the intelligence community and people in the medical community, psychiatrists, doctors, dentists, people like that, because it was being written up as a kind of a scientific find. We'll talk in a minute about Timothy Leary. He was one of those kinds of scientists who, who, who understood what LSD was. Really, until late 1966, October of 1966, LSD was perfectly legal because it really wasn't seen as much of a threat. It was just a drug that was possible for treatment. Um, people started using it. Uh, at first, it was outlawed in California in October 1966, and then it became illegal around the rest of the country. Uh, one uh, uh, consequence of all this is that the people who knew about LSD and its possible recreational effects uh, were people sort of in the upper crust of society, doctors, uh, dentists, perhaps the people that they, they mingled with socially, lawyers, business people, um, who would often take uh, LSD, well, sometimes would take LSD at the end of an evening uh, while they were having their coffee after dessert. They would drop a tab of acid and, and, and trip. And um, it was not thought of as dangerous, so long as you were in a confined situation. And, uh, and so that's what, that's what went on. In fact, the Beatles, uh, at least uh, John Lennon and George Harrison, were the first, if you might say, victims uh, of this uh, that we can think of in, uh, among the big bands in popular music. This happened already in early 1965. The Beatles, uh, uh, John and George, with their wives, went to um, uh, dinner with a dentist uh, in England that they knew. And afterwards, while they were having a coffee, unbeknownst to them, he dosed it with a little bit of LSD, and, and, and all of them uh, uh, began to trip. In fact, it didn't happen initially, and the, the guy kept asking him, how are you feeling, how are you feeling? And they were getting a little bit creeped out by this. They thought he was trying to get something going on, maybe sexually or something. And so they left, and as they were leaving, uh, uh, in, in the car, all of a sudden, the LSD clicked in, and the rest of the night uh, was... Um, was a, a full-blown uh, LSD trip. The, the Beatles uh, actually, I think, probably liked it pretty okay because they took it again, uh, again and again for a while there. Uh, but again, it came to them through these sort of elite party types. So we're talking about the Beatles doing LSD in early 1965, and through, except for Paul McCartney, who was the last one to try. Well, we don't really hear about LSD on a large scale until the summer of 1967, which is thought of as the summer of love. And so a lot of this stuff going on under the radar. Now, why would people want to take LSD? I mean, we, we hear what the, what the effects of it are. Um, what, what, what would be the value in that? Well, one of the values of it could be that it's just fun. I mean, the, the world is full of people who want to take drugs just to kind of get messed up and have a recreational time. But LSD was really invested in a more 
serious-minded kind of counterculture uh, idea. idea. Um, LSD was um, uh, mixed up in the idea of higher consciousness. That is, by taking LSD, you could kind of break down all of the uh, barriers that had been built up by um, conforming to society's uh, uh, lies, they would say, or the rules of society. So somehow, by taking LSD, you could become more what yourself, more authentic, what you had always uh, maybe intended to be by nature, but were denied by the way that you were brought up and made to conform uh, within modern society. So it was seen as a way to wisdom, uh, a way to higher consciousness. And so, uh, this idea was very consistent with the idea of a counterculture, which the hippies uh, at the end of the 60s began to sort of propound, this idea that we could create a, a culture that, that didn't make the kinds of mistakes that our parents' cultures made, our parents who lied to us, our, our teachers who lied to us, the government who lies to us, the church who lies to us, everybody was lying to us. We needed to get back to the truth. And LSD could be the kind of magic bullet that would help you get that higher consciousness that would be able to help you recalibrate your mind a little bit and see uh, this truth. This, of course, the LSD uh, use uh, led to the idea of the trip because the LSD experience, it was experienced as a trip, but the, the idea of, of trip became this, this sort of word that was, uh, that was in the, uh, uh, the vocabulary of most people talking about the counterculture. So if somebody was uh, having a bad trip, it could either be a real LSD trip or it could just be a bad experience. Uh, I might say about somebody, uh, you know, what's his trip? So this, this idea of trip comes into it. Now, you can think of music uh, fitting into this in two ways. Music, uh, uh, music could be used to enhance the LSD trip, and it's sort of secondary to the drug experience. This is kind of what Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters were about. We'll talk about them in the next video. That is that music would be used as, a, as something that would be going on while you were having the drug trip as a way of making the drug trip maybe more intense or, or, or creating a sort of stimulus that would, would, would allow things to happen. But it also started to be that music itself could be the trip in absence of the LSD or the acid itself. The idea that music takes you on a kind of journey. And in order to do this, the music has got to become more conceptual, musically speaking, probably more ambitious, more seriousness of purpose, longer, certainly, uh, to take you on a trip, unless it's going to be a very short trip. Interestingly, uh, these hippies, with this sort of spiritual music is a trip kind of idea, started to recreate an attitude toward music, especially toward absolute music, which had already been prevalent in 19th century uh, European art music. So people had talked about Beethoven symphonies in, in a lot the same way. So what we want to do in the next video is we want to concentrate on how music gets serious and ambitious. If music itself is going to become a kind of a trip, or even if it's going to enhance the trip, how does music get serious and ambitious in order to, uh, to accomplish that goal? That's where we'll turn with the next video.